Good morning. My name is Mike Grobelch. I am the pastor at Peace Lutheran Church in Pico Rivera and St. John Lutheran Church in North Long Beach. And I'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. Jesus has risen. We are thankful to God that you are here to worship with us this morning. Your presence is a gift from God. We pray and hope that he will bless our worship time here together. If you would like to receive copies of the bulletin and sermon prior to our service, please email us at peace, P-E-A-C-E-L-U-T-H-C-H at gmail.com. Or you can send a direct message to us at either of our Facebook pages, Peace Lutheran Church Pico Rivera or St. John Lutheran Church North Long Beach. I would ask that as we begin our service that you join in wherever you may be. He is risen. He has risen. He has risen. We unite as God's people. We begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess tra my transgressions unto the Lord. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded, and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Our first reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made them both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson for today comes from the book of 1 Peter, beginning in chapter 1 at verse 17. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but it has made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised from him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went up to them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know that these things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he that they had seen him in a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. 
some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to a village which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to, the, to them in the breaking of the bread. This May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. There is a subtle but a very persistent theme in the events of the resurrection as told in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It shows up in the announcement that the angels make to the women at the tomb. Listen to the angel's words, and you will hear a common thread. In Matthew's account, the angel said, He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. In Mark, the angel says, Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Luke's account is the longest. In his account, the angel says, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and to be crucified and on the third day rise. Did you notice the small but very important idea that each angel had in their message? 
each of these accounts made it clear and made it an important part of the angel's message that the resurrection was a reminder that Jesus had regularly told his disciples that he would rise from the dead. They were all included with an emphasis on the word of Jesus. And since Jesus is God, this is an emphasis on the word of God. Jesus himself made this very clear in the reading we just heard. Jesus joined two of his disciples who were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened. But when they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Notice that Jesus did not immediately reveal himself to them. Instead, he first taught them from the word of God. The opening words of their conversation shows how much they needed this instruction. Jesus greeted them by asking a perfectly natural question. What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? This gave the two travelers opportunity to express their grief at Jesus' death. In their grief, the two travelers stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered them, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? From these words, we learn that the news of Jesus' crucifixion had spread throughout Jerusalem. Cleopas assumed that everyone who had been in Jerusalem would have known all about it. Then Jesus asked one of the open-ended questions that gave Cleopas and his friend an opportunity to talk. He said to them, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. This is a, probably a very good summary of Jesus' ministry. It even speaks of the resurrection. The words, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, even proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah. The only problem is they didn't believe that it was true. Their words showed that they knew everything they needed to believe in Jesus. Nevertheless, from their point of view, it was more like a dream than reality. Right then and there, Jesus could have said, here I am. The accounts of my resurrection are true. He could have showed him his hands, his feet, and his side. He could have shown him that he was alive, but instead he chose not to. Instead, he began a very intense Bible study. He said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted, interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Before Jesus revealed himself to his two disciples, he showed them Christ in Moses and in the prophets, in what you and I would call the Old Testament. He taught them the entire Old Testament points to Christ. He used the Old Testament to show the two disciples that it was necessary that the Christ should suffer as they had witnessed with their own eyes and ears. He showed them from the Old Testament that the very heart of which it was meant to be that Christ was to be handed over to the chief priests and rulers to be delivered 
and condemned to death and eventually crucified. According to the scriptures, this is exactly what Christ came to do and experience. This very testimony that they gave while explaining the happenings in Jerusalem, who Jesus was, what he experienced, his suffering and death, this very testimony points to Jesus as the Messiah promised by God in the Holy Scriptures. Last week, we heard John's account of Jesus appearing to the disciples in the locked room. When Thomas saw the Lord, he confessed, my Lord and my God. Jesus responded to Thomas and said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. In today's gospel, we hear how Jesus did that with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. In this account, Jesus pointed to the Holy Scriptures as proof of his resurrection before he revealed himself to his disciples. They did not know it was Jesus talking to them. Nevertheless, they believed because of the testimony of the Holy Scriptures. They believed without seeing. When Jesus first joined the disciples, they had the facts exactly right, but the facts depressed them. The facts depressed them because they did not interpret the facts in the light of the scriptures. They did not understand how the crucifixion fit into God's plan. They had hoped it was he was the one to redeem Israel, but they did not understand that the crucifixion was the way that Christ did the redeeming. It was Jesus who opened the Holy Scriptures to them that they began to understand that in the crucifixion, Jesus not only redeems Israel, but he redeemed the entire world. Jesus opened the gospel of the Old Testament to them, and the Holy Spirit called them by that gospel. The Holy Spirit created faith in them even though they did not recognize it was Jesus himself who had taught them. Not only did the Holy Spirit bring them to faith, but they became an example to the, of those who have not seen and yet believed. There are many devout Christians who really wished they could have heard the Bible class that Jesus gave on the road to Emmaus. How wonderful it would to be to, be, to hear God's word taught by the perfect teacher. While we cannot know every last detail of his teaching, today's reading gives us insight into the general theme of his teaching. In fact, this coming Friday, I will, we will talk to our catechumens about to explain this theme to us. What is the key to correct understanding of the Bible? Officially, the answer is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the heart and center of the scripture, and therefore he is the key to the true meaning. This is a primary principle of biblical interpretation taught by the scriptures themselves and demonstrated today in the gospel. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I had a professor who taught me in my Old Testament class, he said, you can cut the Old Testament and everywhere you cut it, it bleeds Christ. It, all of it points to Christ becoming a human, living on earth and eventually dying for our sins and being resurrected. Now that Jesus had taught them the, from the Holy Scriptures, it was time for them to share a meal. As they talked, the two disciples drew near to the village where they were going. Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is coming, uh, and the end of the day is now spent. And so he went and stayed with them. This is a common Middle East uh, hospitality at work. There were mo no motels, no hotels or public lodgings. As travelers came to the end of the day, those who had further to go acted as though they would continue the journey. Those who had arrived at their destination insisted that the other travelers stay with them and enjoy their hospitality. Hospitality included a meal. 
when you stayed at someone's house, they would serve a meal to you. They would bless the food and serve it to you, the guest. But something changed as this guest came to eat with his two disciples. Notice how Jesus turns the tables on his host. He became the host and served them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Jesus was the invited guest, but he became the host. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to the two disciples. Jesus, God, was serving his disciples. It was as Jesus served them with his meal that they, he finally revealed himself to them. This pattern of teaching and eating is very common in the Bible. The gospel records many meals that Jesus had with a variety of people. Every time there was a teaching before eating. First, there was a teaching from the word of God. Then there was a meal with Christ. This meal in Emmaus was different in that this meal after Jesus rose from the dead. In this meal, Jesus began teaching the disciples that although they could not always see him, he was always with them. He was with them in disguise on the road as he taught from God's word. He was with them as he broke bed and they recognized him. He is still with them even after he disappeared from their sight. This pattern of God hearing God's word and then eating God's meal has made it way into the liturgy of the church. We follow the pattern that Jesus used when we first have the service of the word, where we hear the teaching that Jesus has passed on to us through the writings of his apostles. We continue that pattern as we eat a meal with Jesus and with all the company of heaven, even as Jesus gives us his body and blood for us to eat and drink. Even though we cannot see Jesus, he has promised to be with us. He is with us as we hear the word of God, and the Holy Spirit uses it to strengthen our faith. Then after we hear the teaching that is based on the word of God, we have a meal. And with Jesus, he feeds us his true body and his true blood, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus comes to us in his word. He comes to us as his word falls on our ears and he comes and the word is combined with bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, in each case, Jesus reveals himself to us. He is just as if he, he were walking with us on a road heading toward Emmaus. We have his promise and by his promise, he gives us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Amen. Now let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O risen Savior, set free our tongues to confess your resurrection before a world still held captive to sin and death. Give us courage to go into every place and to speak in every language the salvation won for us upon the cross and the hope granted to us of life that death cannot overcome. Lord, in your mercy, O risen Savior, make us to burn with fire of your love that we may love you above all things and love our neighbors as ourselves. Deliver us from fear and relieve the anxiety of our hearts, 
that we may live out fully the hope planted within us and the new lives we receive in the waters of our baptism. Lord, in your mercy. O risen Savior, anoint the words of those who preach to us your gospel and open our ears to hear with faith all that he has done to save us. Raise us up many who will serve you in the various callings of your church and who will serve us in your name with your word and your gifts. Lord, in your mercy, O risen Savior, hear us on behalf of Donald, our president, Gavin, our governor, the Congress of the United States, and all state and local elected officials. Guide them according to your word that their labors for our nation's health and welfare may not be in vain, nor forgetful of the vulnerable, aging, and unemployed. Lord, in your mercy, O risen Savior, across our nation there are so many imprisoned. Bless all prison workers that they may be humane and serve with integrity. Bless those incarcerated with a hope for the future and amendment of life. Help them to serve their sentences with patience and trust in you, and bless their families who love them. Lord, in your mercy, O risen Savior, hear us on behalf of those who cry to you in any need, especially the sick, the suffering, the disabled, the wounded in spirit, those who suffer mental illnesses, and those in their last days on earth. Give them grace according to their need and sustain them in their afflictions to the day when their sufferings will be exchanged for glory in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. O risen Savior, accept the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving from our lips and the tithes and offerings we bring this day. Increase in your people the delight of your mercy, gratitude for all your benefits, and eagerness to support the mission of your church in word and your deed. Lord, in your mercy, all praise to you, dear Father in heaven, for you have opened up the way to eternal life in the resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks for all those who have gone before us in the faith and now rest from their labors. Keep us in that same faith and embolden us by your resurrection to be fearless in the face of disease, chaos, loneliness, and every sorrow in this world. Give us, along with Job, the solemn expectation to cheer us. Our Redeemer lives, and we too shall be resurrected and glorified to live with him in his eternal kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our resurrected Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Please join me in saying the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace.
A few announcements for the parishioners of Peace and St. John's. Uh, a couple of people have uh, inquired about what to do with their offerings. If you are so moved, you may email or mail them into uh, the office of either St. John's or Peace, depending on where you're a member, and we'll make sure that you get the appropriate receipts. Uh, at this time, we don't have an idea of when we're reopening. I basically am praying and hoping that it will be towards the end of summer, that by they should have the uh, coronavirus under control by that time. We can thank uh, God that none of our members are currently in the hospital, and so we praise God with that. We also can, can uh, say that none of our members... Uh, have the coronavirus. So we praise and thank God for that wonderful, wonderful blessing. Uh, with that, if there are any concerns or you need to talk to me, uh, you have my uh, email address, you have my phone, I'm happy to entertain uh, calls at any time. And with that, go in peace and serve the Lord. I would like to th thank a couple of people uh, for helping us making this tape possible today. For Katja Richardson, Rory Selden, and Maria Coronado who make this taping possible by the use of their talents. We thank them and we thank God for their talents. May God's perfect peace be with you all. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>